So first, let me make a disclaimer. Uh, Caprina mentioned that I'm part of Fair Mormon, I'm a volunteer. Um, I, I speak for myself, I don't speak for Fair Mormon, and we don't speak for the church either, either. we're an independent uh, organization. Um, you know, we're not, it's impossible to cover everything in, in a video like this. Um, so, you know, obviously there's gonna be stones left unturned, um, but hopefully this will this will connect people with uh, an interest in looking at some faithful uh, sources, because you know history is is not uh, is history has to be interpreted, right? So you look at the facts, and uh, and people make judgments based on those facts, sometimes lousy facts. Um, for my part, I look at this very very difficult uh, difficult issue, and believe me, you know in, in Defending the church here, we're not saying that we want polygamy back. This is not what we're saying at all. We don't want this. Um, but I think we can do a better job of understanding it than a lot of times uh, people have done. We'll look at this, probably the same sources, interpret them differently. Uh, take a look, I hope, at uh, you know who says what, because that's as important as what they say. Um, so with, with that kind of disclaimer, then let's start. Okay, so um, do you want to go ahead and just give... Um, a basic uh, history of polygamy for those of us that are not super versed in the, you know, the proceedings. So, so um, what if, what if we start by, by laying out the reason? Because I think um, understanding the reason for polygamy, what we, you know, some things that we know, some things we don't, obviously, but uh, if I understand the reason, then I think the timeline of things will make better sense. The first thing is Joseph was the the prophet of the restoration. Well, that restoration included um, the restoration of an ancient law, the law of polygamy. Um, so that was part of it, as he understood it, that was, that was part of his mission. Uh, it was also really, really important, as we, I hope we'll be able to show, it was important to Joseph that everybody be able to be sealed. We kind of take that for granted today. Uh, they didn't take that for granted back then. Joseph wanted to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to be sealed by the Holy Priesthood. So that was uh, very, very important. Uh, it was important to raise up a righteous posterity. That was, uh, that was a big part of it too. Um, and then finally, uh, as a trial, Joseph understood early on that this was gonna be a big trial for the saints. Uh, uh, and maybe even for that reason, uh, maybe it may have been one of the reasons that he shrunk from implementing this, um, but uh, but this was a some would call it an Abrahamic trial. Um, maybe to, to drill down a little bit on on this this enthusiasm for uh, for covenant sealing, you know we kind of take it for granted, but in Joseph's time, the understanding was to death you part. There's no such thing as as family relations as we understand them uh, hereafter. So so Joseph says something interesting. Can I read a Read a quote here? Please. Okay. Uh, and this is from Wilford Woodruff's journal in March of 1844. He says, again, the doctrine or sealing power of Elijah is as follows. If you have power to seal on earth and in heaven, then we should be crafty. The first thing you do, go and seal on earth your sons and daughters unto yourself, and yourself unto your fathers in eternal glory. And go ahead and not go back, but use a little craftiness and seal all you can. And when you get to heaven, Tell your father that what you seal on earth should be sealed in heaven. I will walk through the gate of heaven and claim what I seal and those that follow me and my counsel. So there was this, uh, this drive to bind people together, to bind families together, to bind the community of the church together in these bonds of brotherhood and these family ties um, with the feeling that we, you know, that we've inherited this doctrine that these relationships can last into eternity. Uh, there's, there's a parallel kind of uh, phenomenon that was, that's also kind of little understood by Latter Saints today, and this was the doctrine of adoption. So, it, it, just imagine yourself as a Latter Saint. Uh, you know, chances are your parents have uh, disowned you and thrown you out because you joined, uh, joined with the Mormons. Um, who are you going to be sealed to? Well, probably not them. So, what did they do? They found. Uh, they found a prominent member of the church, usually, uh, you know, one of the twelve or one of the other leaders of the church, 
and they were adopted. And, and a lot of times it didn't even matter if, you know, maybe I was older than Wilford Woodruff at the time. I'd still be sealed as his son. So, uh, so there was this idea of trying to connect everyone together. Even this idea that, you know, to assure your place in that heavenly kingdom, you, you go and you adopt yourself to uh, the most righteous person that you, you really are confident you're, you're going to see there. Um, and, and that was that was considered important. Now, later on, the doctrine uh, develops. Wilfred Woodruff um, said he received by revelation the commandment, okay, stop, stop doing this. Uh, everybody, it's time to start sealing yourselves to your own ancestors. Back as far as you can. And they actually went back and undid some of these, you know, adoptions to, to prominent members of the church. And this is the way that we understand it now, is that we, is that we, uh, we seal ourselves to our ancestors. Whether we expect them to be there or not, God's going to sort that out. Uh, you know, whatever adjustments need to be made uh, can be made. And so, uh, so I think this is kind of the same feeling that, that, um, that prompts this enthusiasm for, let's just let's get everybody sealed that, that is willing and wants to. Um, I think another note is, is worthwhile on this. You know, concerns have been raised, well, does, does polygamy actually raise up a righteous seed as, it in, as it's intended to? And I think um, studies have shown that, uh, that polygamy reduces the number of offspring to each childbearing woman, okay? But since more women are involved in marriages, the overall number numbers grow up. And so really, uh, the program of the church did, uh, did what it set out to do in, in uh, raising up a missionary force, a, a faithful um, posterity. It, it's interesting, too, that, um, that it looks like even men's participation in marriage was higher in Utah than in the rest of the country, which is really, uh, really saying something. Uh, we automatically assume that all men got married. That's not true. And, and then, uh, to, to hone in on that even a little bit more, well, the point isn't just to have a ton of children. The point is to raise up a righteous posterity. So, so children born to, um, to a mother and father that are both committed and faithful, they're more likely to be faithful. This is a fact. Children born to uh, to uh, mismatched parents are less likely uh, to, to carry on in that same faith tradition. So, all right, how's that for starters? Sounds good. Okay. good. Now, you, you'd asked me about a little bit of a history of, uh, or a timeline of polygamy. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that Joseph really probably knew very early that this was going to be... Uh, required of the church as early as 1831. Well, why then? Because he's translating the Bible. He's, he's going through and revising the Bible. Um, and so, of course, he's reading about the ancient patriarchs. You can imagine him reading through there and thinking, okay, well, what's this? How is this right? Um, and, and we think that's where this, uh, where this started. His first um, polygamous marriage, we think, was in 1835 or 1836, and that's to Fanny Alger. The next is not for quite a while. 1841, and, and after this, there's this period where, where there's a run of, of what we're gonna we're gonna uh, get more specific about this, but a run of uh, eternity only sealings, which is to say, the the sealing takes effect when both of the parties are dead, so they don't live together. They're uh, they're not intimate together. Uh, it, it's it. Uh, takes effect once both are dead. So we'll talk about maybe why uh, why this happens. So the next little while it's like that. And then after after this, then really you could say that uh, that Joseph's um, plural marriages begin in earnest. Um, so the question of why he waited, I mean, that's quite a long time. If he learned about this in 1931, he waits quite a long time if he knows that this is going to be required of the church, why? Why does he wait? Um, my conviction from his letters and Emma's letters, they loved each other. He loved his wife. 
uh, I, I don't think it's um, it's wrong to portray uh, their relationship really as a romance the way that we would understand it. Uh, I, I believe he didn't want to, to hurt her. Um, and, uh, and I think that's that really probably is the biggest reason. Now, again, I can't go back and read his mind, but that's putting it all together, that's what I see. Uh, others may, may see things differently. Another reason for delaying uh, contemporaries of his, uh, including those that he, that he talked to early on about this, for, say that he foresaw the trouble that this would, would cause the church. In fact, you know, we, we, have these, we have these stories related by many of his plural wives that um, he told them that he was visited by an angel three times over the course of several years with the commandment, reiterating this commandment that he had to, uh, to begin or to move forward with the practice of plural marriage. And, and, and so, you know, you're thinking what I think a person naturally thinks when they hear this, oh, yeah, sure, an angel told you. That's, that's, that's convenient, that's easy. And in fact, um, the reactions of some of his plural wives were the same. So I thought it'd be it'd be useful to um, to look at the experience of Mary Leitner. Joseph told her that he'd been instructed to teach her the principle of plural marriage and to invite her to comply with it if she was willing. Um, and so let's let's uh, can I read another kind of extended quotation here? Go for it. So um, this is a quote from her. Joseph was commanded to take me for a wife. I was a thousand miles from him. He got afraid. The angel came to him three times, the last time with a drawn sword, let's see, um, and threatened his life. I did not believe. So this was not some dupe. That's me saying that. <laughs> if God told him so, why did he not come and tell me? The angel told him I should have a witness. An angel came to me. It went through me like lightning, and I was afraid. In another place, she gives uh, some more detail about this. She says, I knelt down, and if ever a poor mortal prayed, I did. A few nights after that, an angel of the Lord came to me, and if ever a thrill went through a mortal, it went through me. I gazed upon the clothes and figure, but the eyes were like lightning. They pierced me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I was frightened almost to death for a moment. The angel leaned over me and the light was very great, although it was night. Joseph came up the next Sabbath. He said, have you had a witness yet? No, she says no. An angel wasn't, uh, wasn't enough. Continue with the quote. Well, said he, the angel expressly told me that you should have, said I. I have not had a witness but I have had something I have never seen before. I saw an angel and I was frightened almost to death. I did not speak. And this was from an address that she gave at BYU in 1905. She later details that it was quite a while after that that she got the spiritual witness that, that, uh, uh, that she required before moving forward with that. So she did eventually marry him. She did, okay. she did, yeah. And I just think that's fascinating that uh, he told her he saw an angel. She didn't believe him. She saw an angel, and that even wasn't good enough. I mean, I think that's, I th I think that's um, uh, instructive. This, this was not easy. These were not, you know, uh, dupes. These were not uh, gals that were wowed by, you know, a handsome guy uh, or overawed by his, uh, his position or prominence. These, these were people that sought for and a spiritual witness. They did this for spiritual reasons. Let's see. Um, so, I, you know, I look at all of this, and it is impossible to capture all the kind of things that kind of go into an impression like this, but, but I'm not the only one that thinks that Joseph was a reluctant polygamist. Um, now, I, I want to be clear because the historical record is clear um, you know there were intimate relations involved in many of these marriages uh, we're not 
you know, obviously we don't know all the details and probably shouldn't. Um, but we know enough to, to realize that these, uh, that these were not strictly platonic kinds of uh, arrangements. These were marriages, in, or at least the, the sisters involved, when they talked about this effort, they understood these to be marriages in very deed, uh, most of them. And, and yet, there are no known children from any of these marriages. And we're talking about you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 marriages. Now, as we said, some of these are going to be eternity only. They wouldn't have taken, uh, taken effect during this life. We're still, talking no about, we're still talking about Joseph's marriages? We're talking about Joseph's marriages, okay. yeah. Talking, talking specifically about Joseph. Uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't make the claim that Brigham was a, uh, you know, milk or toast polygamist. That that wouldn't be reasonable to, to say. Uh, but, but Joseph, and I think that I think that's an important distinction, you know, adjusting to something that you know is going to be a commandment. That's different than being the one that has to, uh, you know, uh, bring this to, to your people and, and, uh, and bring out that commandment. Um, so, no known children. From, from any of these other marriages. Because recently, the one remaining possible candidate, Josephine Lyon, has been ruled out on the basis of uh, genetic studies. Uh, Oro, uh, Ugo Perego was, uh, was involved in that. I'll, I'll put a link to that. And, and the other thing is, we know that Joseph's plural wives were as fertile as any other women. Their, their subsequent marriages in Utah uh, bear that out. Uh, Sarah Ann Whitney, seven children. Lucy Walker, nine children. Melissa Lott, seven children, and so forth. And these were these were plural wives uh, at, at the time too. And some of them demonstrably, you can show that they uh, that they conceived uh, quite rapidly after after their new marriages. So, uh, what do we make of that? Well, uh, to me, that conveys that even though uh, these were to be probably the, most of them marriages in very deed, uh, I, I really think that Joseph wasn't very enthusiastic about it. He loved his wife. He didn't want to be, I, I personally think he didn't want to be with uh, someone other than the woman that he loved. That's my, that's my feeling. As a doctor, did you know about birth control at the time? Was that really an option? Uh, yeah, well, they, they, had a, they had a pretty good idea of what caused babies, most of them in all likelihood. Uh, no, uh, there, was no, there was no birth control not in the sense that we have today. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, then, then I thought I, uh, this would flow naturally into, into a, little, a brief discussion of eternity-only sealing. So we said these would take effect only after uh, the death of both people involved. See, I think that, that Joseph thought that these kind of sealings would be a way to comply with the commandment and not anger, offend, hurt Emma. You know, I really think that's bottom line. Now again, this is me trying to, uh, uh, trying to guess what Joseph is thinking, but I, I think that's a good, good explanation why, okay, one uh, plural marriage, a long time passes, another one, and then this run of, of eternity only ceilings. You know, that, that's, that's what I think. I'm not the only one who thinks that. Um, examples of that? Um, yeah. Okay. Do we have some? Because I, I, I think this is really uh, quite interesting. So Ruth Vo Sayers, uh, she, was a, she, she lived in Massachusetts, baptized in Boston. And when Joseph was, was there, it, it, it sounds like he, uh, he became friends with her husband. So, so her, uh, her testimony to, uh, to Brother Jensen, who recorded a lot of these stories, uh, goes like this, or his, his report of this. While there, the strongest affection sprang up between the Prophet Joseph and Mr. Sayers. The latter, not attaching much importance to the theory of a future life, insisted that his wife Ruth should be sealed to the Prophet for eternity, as he himself should only claim her in this life. She was accordingly sealed to the Prophet in Emma Smith's presence thus became numbered among the prophet's plural wives. She, however, continued to live with Mr. Sayers until his death. And there's other data that suggests that she was the one that initiated this. As you can imagine, a, a gal that knows about um, the idea of, of, of a celestial marriage, whose husband, you know, he didn't even think there's life after death. He's just not interested, but he's willing. Okay, fine, if it makes you feel better. 
no, go ahead. You can imagine the appeal. So there's evidence that that, that this was uh, that, that sometimes the sisters initiated these these things. And so it wasn't uncommon for married women to be sealed while they continued to live with their husband, expecting that the sealing would would you know bind them to someone in the eternities. Good point. Good point. That's a, that's absolutely true. And and so you know we can't always know. We can't ever really know what they're thinking because sometimes this wasn't just a non-member uh, you know, husband uh, where the non-member was the husband um, or reverse that but sometimes the, not, the, uh, the husband was a member but for whatever reason they wanted to go ahead and have and be sealed to Joseph I suspect and I can't know but I suspect that probably that comes back to along these lines of, of adoption you, you get sealed to someone that you're pretty sure is going to be there in the celestial kingdom, that was the thinking. Now our thinking is different today. So uh, that's my thought. Okay. So, so the second example, this this I find really fascinating because this is Brigham Young's sister, Fanny. Now, his sister at the time, fifty six years old. Okay. And so this is this is uh, this is according to Brigham. I recollect a sister, his sister, conversing with Joseph Smith on this subject. She told him. Now don't talk to me. When I get into the celestial kingdom, if I ever do get there, I shall request the privilege of being a ministering angel. That is the labor I wish to perform. I don't want any companion in that world. And if the Lord will make me a ministering angel, it is all I want. Joseph said, Sister, you talk very foolishly. You do not know what you will want. He then said to me, and this is, this is Brigham speaking, he then said to me, here, Brother Brigham, you seal this lady to me. I sealed her to him. This was my own sister, according to the flesh. So, um, I, I think that's uh, that's fascinating. Of course, then that was this, that was an eternity uh, only uh, only type of marriage. All right, let's see. Where does this? Uh, Do you mind if I interject? Yeah, go ahead. Do you have um, a rough estimate of how many wives we believe that Joseph had? Uh, you know, close to 35 is what it seems like. Uh, not 40, more than 30, probably 35. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is that good on the history? And that, and that includes everything lumped together. Okay. Yeah, that sounds... I'm satisfied with that. Okay, thank <laughs> this, you. Again, this is just a starting discussion. I, mean, I, hope, I really hope that people will, will look at some of the references and, and start digging into this. Don't take my word for it. So next question that I have, um, something that's come up on the page also that I've wondered, uh, what do you make of um, Emma Smith's open opposition to polygamy? Shouldn't God have revealed that to her as strongly as she did to Joseph if she was the, the first wife of the prophet and obviously her, import, her support um, would have huge influence? You know, that's a, that's a very, very important question. And, um, and, and I'll be honest, you know, why God does what God does, I don't think we have to look to, uh, you know, God commanding polygamy or God commanding Abraham to go up on Mount Moriah to sacrifice them. We don't have to look that far to, to find instances where we don't understand what God's doing. I think each of us in our own lives can probably um, come up with with those kinds of questions. So so as to why, why God does or doesn't reveal to someone, I mean, why did he... Why did he send an angel to uh, to Sister Leitner and not to him? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He does what he does. I do think, though, that um, that finally uh, we're coming around to a greater sense of compassion for Emma, and I think that's important. Um, I can't put myself in her place. I don't pretend to, but I imagine. Um, and uh, you know, that's that's painful. That's tough. Um, so I certainly am not one that would pass judgment on Emma, and I think, and uh, you know, a charitable kind of uh, outlook towards her, I, I think, is warranted. Um, but I, but I do think it's, I think it's worthwhile noting, you know, that she went back and forth with, um, with plural marriage. There were times when she could support it. She was involved in several, we know from later accounts, she was involved in several 
um, plural marriages. Others were kept secret from her. Um, we don't know when when Joseph started talking to her about her. We don't know. Uh, maybe he started talking about it as soon as he knew back in 1831. We have no way to know that. Um, but uh, but she had this rocky road to that. What never wavered was her testimony that, that her husband Joseph was was a prophet. And I think that really says something. I mean, if anyone had a reason uh, to doubt Joseph's calling, she did. But she was witness to a lot of the, and a contributor to the most important founding um, events of the Restoration. So I think that's important to, to note. Um, so, how's that? Okay. Yeah, uh, can we mention one thing? Yeah. Um, Joseph marrying women in secret. Um, what about that? That's bound to infuriate Emma. Um, and, and it did. It, it, it in fact did. Why would he do that? <sighs> yeah, why would he do that? Um, uh, honestly, we don't know. I can, you know, so again, trying to put myself in Joseph's position, not always a, uh, a surefire way to know what's going on in, uh, in, in Joseph's head. In fact, I think that can often lead to the, the absolute wrong conclusion. But I suspect, I suspect, he didn't want to, he didn't want to hurt Emma. I'm gonna guess, and this is totally a guess, that he had made some kind of overtures, some attempt to discuss this, but, uh, but I suspect from, from her reactions, he, he probably had a pretty good idea that that was not going to fly. Um, so you can imagine, I mean, him feeling caught between the love of his life and the, the command that he knew he was ultimately going to have to obey. That's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. Um, okay, next question. Do we have any evidence of forged or faulty documents and stories? I ask this because, um, frankly, there are some just absolutely horrendous stories out there that I, I can't live with and believe that Joseph is a prophet. So I, for me personally, it's important for me to know that maybe there is a way to substantiate or uh, refute some of these stories. Yeah, you know, this, this is such a good question. Can, can I just start, though, with, with this notion that can be a little foreign to Latter-day Saints, um, that a prophet is not always going to behave the way that we think a prophet should. So, um, I, mean, I think we have to be open to the idea that God is going to do some unexpected things. Well, the fact that we're even having this discussion about polygamy is, you know, case in point, exhibit A, and that God does things that aren't expected, that we don't think are very uh, holy or, or prophet-like. You know, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, there's plenty of other examples like that. I mean, you know, the simile curses that, that Old Testament prophets, you know, going through the streets of Jerusalem naked with a rope around your neck to demonstrate that, that Jerusalem's going to be carried away captive. I mean, the list could go on. Prophets do things that are unexpected. Okay. Uh, so, so we can't, we got to be careful about holding that as the standard. A prophet is a prophet as long as it does what I think is okay. Well, that's dangerous. Can we get into one story, though, and just kind of see how that feels? Re redirect me, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Only because, I mean, I don't, I think one thing we don't expect is for a prophet to be promiscuous. Right. So right. can we just, um, a story that I've heard tossed around a lot is um, the barn story where Emma Smith allegedly, uh, through a peephole in the barn, found Joseph um, having intercourse with Fanny Alger. Yeah. That's the story. You know, um, th this, is a, um, this is a place where looking at who says what is really, really important. One source for this it's late, it's second hand, it's William McClellan. Uh, and for those of you that know, that know about William McClellan, well, he apostatized early on. He, you know, he had been excommunicated for adultery himself early on. He was readmitted to the church, then was excommunicated for apostasy. When Joseph was incarcerated in Liberty Jail, he ransacked the Smith's home. He took, took Joseph's uh, jewelry, his clothes, his blankets, Emma wanted to bring him a blanket for the uh, uh, for the winter time in jail. She had no blanket to give him because William McClellan had taken their stuff. She she confronts him and says, "Why would you do this?" He says, "Because I can." During this same time period, 
he gets permission from a Missouri sheriff uh, to, to whip and club Joseph Smith. Well, he, he, when, the, when the jailer, when the sheriff, refuses to let him do this with Joseph still in chains, and he backs out. This is the kind of feelings that he had to, to Joseph. Okay, now, so think about that. And when he says, Emma Smith told me this, um, do you think that's the person of all people that Emma is going to unburden her soul to? We're saying that he's the only source of that story. He's the only source for that story. He's the, she, he's the only one that she's going to tell about that? Really? Um, on the other hand, he had plenty of reason, plenty of motivation, uh, not just, you know, I think, to kill Joseph Smith, uh, but to embarrass him and so forth like that. So, uh, credibility, a big issue there. A big, big issue there. Okay. Um, can we hit a couple more? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Emma pushing Eliza down the stairs, causing a miscarriage, obviously out of jealousy. And I, I remember hearing this when I was known the church. There is absolutely nothing to this. There's, there's no, uh, there's no evidence for this story. No journals, so, no. Yeah. So we'll, and, and it's a, you know, it, at best, it's possibly a conflation of some other stories that happened to other people, uh, and I'll, and I'll include a reference to a BYU Studies article that, that details that. But okay. There's nothing to that. Okay. Um. Oh, okay. So I guess we can just uh, hand over. The big book of uh, Eliza Young, um, one of Brigham's ex-wives, yeah. who wrote the book *The Nineteenth Wife*. Yeah, and so, the story is included in that. And, and I don't even know why this comes up. I, I really don't. I really don't. Uh, because uh, there's absolutely no credibility for this individual. Um, okay, so um, Analyza Webb was married and she was doubtless very very unhappy in her first marriage but she got divorced from her first husband on the recommendation of her family she marries Brigham Young she gets divorced from him uh, you know she asks she asks for the moon in that divorce settlement uh, and, and that wasn't reasonable she leaves and she basically goes on tour of the anti-mormon circuit and she makes her living by Repeating all the lurid tales that are already circulating about uh, about Mormonism and, and life in Utah, uh, she you know she transmits the stories that she that she wouldn't have had any knowledge of about Brigham Young as the head of the Danites, and if you if you sneeze at him, you're you know you're face down in a ditch in Salt Lake City in broad daylight. I mean this this kind of she has absolutely no credibility. No doubt she, no doubt she was a. A tortured soul. I mean, I, I don't know what her first marriage did to her, but subsequent marriages, illicit affairs. She had husband had a husband leave her because she just, you know, she was unfaithful to him. Her family. She was alienated from her family. They didn't want to have anything to do with her. So this is not a person that I really think has any credibility, especially since really what she's doing is passing on the stories that are already circulating. So that was her livelihood. That was her livelihood. Yeah. Okay. Um, did Joseph and Brigham send men away on missions and then marry their wives? Yeah, yeah. Short answer, no. Short answer is no. Um, but things are complicated. Things are complicated, and it's, and it's easy. It's easy to throw that bomb out there. You know, Joseph and Brigham sent men on missions to marry their wives. It's a lot harder than to do a little legwork and understand some complicated situations. I, I thought we'd, we'd look at Zina uh, D. Huntington Young. Okay. So Zina was married. She was sealed for eternity only to Joseph. Okay. She was previously married to another man. She was married to a man named Jacobs. Okay. So she was, she was uh, sealed for eternity to Joseph. Why? She had a husband. He was a member of the church. We don't know. We don't know. But she was. Later, um, she's uh, she's sealed for time to Brigham Young, and and her husband uh, Jacobs is there in Nauvoo when this happens. Why? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that Joseph asked the twelve to uh, to marry and take care of his wife. But you know, she had a husband who, by all appearances, was willing to take care of her. 
Joseph asked the twelve to marry and take care of his wives yes. in the event that he was killed? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and, and after this, after this, for time, sealing to Bigamil, she and Jacob's continued to live and be together as husband and wife. Then in winter quarters, Brigham Young calls Jacobs on a mission. And he tells him basically, uh, and, and you should go and find another wife, she's not your wife. Okay, that's a confusing picture. That's a confusing picture. But what's missing, I notice in all these stories, Zina herself. Well, it turns out she, she told numerous people, quote, I was married to Mr. Jacobs, but the marriage was unhappy, and we parted. In another place, she said that marriage was a most unhappy and ill-assorted marriage. Okay, now that little bit of context, it's not impossible to piece together a, a way that this could make sense, right? She wants out of this marriage. Brigham Young may not be, um, you know, particularly motivated to make that happen. Maybe once, who knows what, but you can imagine him letting things go and then finally saying, okay, look, Jacobs, this, this, this doesn't work. You might as well find another wife, which he does, by the way. Uh, three, three unsuccessful marriages, actually. Divorced three times after Zaina? Divorced Zyna? three times, yeah. Mm. Now, again, maybe too tempting to judge based on that, but um, in, the, in this context, maybe that's important context to give. So do we have accounts, to your knowledge, of men being sent away on missions and coming home to find their wives married to another male? There's ambiguous evidence in another case. One other case? One other case, yeah. Oh, but I, but I, I actually want to have a note here. I want to go back to, to what Jacobs says, because if Jacobs, Brother Jacobs thought that he was wronged by Brigham Young, he probably wouldn't have said this. I do not blame any person. May the Lord our Father bless Brother Brigham and tell him for me I have no feelings against him nor never had. Hmm. Doesn't, doesn't sound like a man who feels, you know, misused in that way. Okay. So. Um, anything more you want to say about that one? Um, well, since, 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 we, since, I, since I threw out, pun intended, the metaphor of, of throwing bombs, I think this is this is worthwhile because look, I just did a whole bunch of legwork there to give context to the story of, of Zina, and uh, but it was easy to say in less than a sentence. Brigham sent him on a mission so he could steal his wife. That's easy to say. It's it's quick to throw a bomb like that. Harder to try and piece together, and in some cases we really can't fully understand the context. So. When, when people read these kind of carpet bombing, barrage style anti-Mormon uh, hit pieces where they just throw out thing after thing after thing after thing after thing, and you just kind of think, well, if any of this is true. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's smoke, there's just something. If with all this, there's got to be something to it. No, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. But you just got to remember, we know this about human nature challenged by thing after thing after thing after thing, even if they're totally unsubstantiated. And, and there are good answers for all these things. Um, that, that it's human nature for some of that to stick. And, and that's, that is a super common, it's become the most common um, tactic of anti-Mormons to try and undermine faith. It's easy to throw those bombs out there. It's harder to do a little legwork, understand a little context. Grow a little bit, yeah. Um, see things a little differently in the past, but but it's not what they portray it to be. You know, maybe there is some truth to it, but twisted in such a way that's very very prejudicial or sensationalized or lurid. You know, so so beware of that. It's this so easy to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else that you want to add before we? Well, I I thought so. In this, maybe along the same lines. Um, Twisting things a certain way, using certain words. Those words matter. And when I hear people talking about, you know, the prophet sleeping around, sleeping around is not equivalent to polygamy. If you think that there's even a possibility that Joseph had priesthood authority from God, 
We're not talking about sleeping, sleeping around. And the words matter. And the words can be used at, to undermine faith. We need to be cautious of that. Um, victims. Victims of polygamy? Well, no. Uh, the standard was that there was no coercion. The, the very words of the sealing ceremony required affirmation that you're doing this of your own free will. Right? Um, Joseph um, offered this arrangement to many women. We can demonstrate that they flat turned him down. No problem. No problem. Turned no down his offered marriage. Turned down his offer. He talked to the principal and said, now the, the ball's in your court. You know, I've been required to teach you this. You can you could take it or leave it. Now, um, and some did. Maybe more that we don't know about. But there was no retribution uh, to that. There was no coercion. And in fact, uh, I think Brigham Young wisely understanding how difficult it is to live, or was, to live in that state, um, tried to make it very easy for women to obtain divorce. Now, for men, he said, if she's willing to live with you, you need to stick it out. But for her, she can have out if, you're, if she doesn't find you suitable. And that's the case. In fact, your, some of your ancestors I can show you that. So we're saying that divorce was kind of like a no questions asked if you want out? No, I don't know about no questions asked, but it was certainly the divorce rules in Utah were much more liberal than in the rest of the United States. For the women? For women, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that you want to include in this? I've asked my Let's questions. Let's see. Let's see. Well, I guess, you know, so, so I'll just include a list of sources, and some of them may not be really even directly related to things that we've talked about, but things, places I think people can go to learn more. Uh, this is a challenging topic. This is tough. Uh, you know, in, in trying to offer some context to this, I am in no way saying that this is easy and not painful. It's painful for them. It's painful for us looking back. And it's only gotten harder with time. We don't have the same context as they do. We don't have the same expectations of marriage as they do. The same, you know, the age differential in some cases, things like that, very different today. So this is not, not an easy thing. But looking at some faithful sources, uh, I think is important. And I think is trans transformative in terms of uh, the way that I uh, have looked at this. So that's what I have to offer today. How's that sound? <laughs> Great. I think I would just add really fast, I don't want to turn the camera around, uh, that this, this understanding polygamy has been a huge trial for me too. I cried and cried over it and just had no idea how to make sense of it because I am married and I can't even fathom that. Um, but uh, doing a little research and looking into um, sources that I feel like I can finally trust um, has, has made all the difference for me in being able to maintain my testimony and understanding um, that it was hard, but, uh, but that maybe it was of God and, and I believe that. So anyways, thanks for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Okay, thanks for tuning in, guys.